Hello and welcome to lecture two for topic 10. And in this lecture, we're going to be looking at checks on the power of the news media. So what are we gonna be covering in this lecture? Well, uh, as I said, we're going to look at the checks on the power of the news media. In that, we're going to look at the role that the law plays in providing a check, uh, the role that journalistic standards may play and the role that the marketplace could potentially play as well. And then we'll conclude the lecture by looking at uh, public attitudes towards the news media and the implications that those have for democracy. All right, that's what we've got on the docket. Let's go ahead and get started. So are there any checks on the news media? Well, by law, very few. While the press may check the government uh, through its adversarial investigative reporting, the government has very little checks on the power of the, uh, the news media. Uh, as we know from our last lecture, that the per press is protected by the First Amendment, although it's not without limits. Um, and here when we're talking about the press, we are talking about sort of the print media. And I'll differentiate between that, uh, between the, the print media and the broadcast media in a second, in terms of why it's relevant to placing checks on the news media. Um, so as we know, the press is protected by the First Amendment, although it's not without limits. Uh, like any form of expression, anything that presents a clear and present danger uh, can be subject to governmental censorship. And the same is true with a newspaper that might, uh, you know, uh, publish uh, some troop coordinates or troop movements or some, you know, uh, secret, uh, you know, documents that are uh, threatening to national security. Uh, if that's the case, the government could, if it's a clear threat to national security, the government could step in and, and, and censor that. Uh, obscenity is not covered by the First Amendment. So if print media was, you know, posting pictures and printing pictures that were clearly obscene, uh, those could be censored. And libel, uh, the, the, the news media, the print media, any news media can be uh, is subject to libel law and can be and can be sued, as we know, because Fox News was sued by Dominion uh, 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 voting uh, services. Uh, and so, you know, from that perspective, there are very, very few um, legal limits. However, do keep in mind that um, that broadcast media has the potential to have a little bit more regulations placed on it. Um, the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, uh, does uh, uh, regulate uh, broadcasters. And so that would be like radio broadcasters and television broadcasters. Uh, the reason is, is because those broadcasting systems, they do use the airwaves and the airwaves, that bandwidth is limited. And so the thinking is, is that the, that air space, that bandwidth is sort of public space. And so to use it, you have to abide by some public guidelines. And in order to, you know, abide by those public guidelines, you get licensed. And if you fail to live up to those standards, your license can be taken away. And so those standards are generally like obscenity standards, decency standards. Uh, there are some rules like if you sell a, um, a, a campaign commercial to one candidate, you have to say it, uh, sell it to another, like the equal time rule, et cetera. Um, so that, you know, that kind of broadcast news media does have uh, you know a little bit more regulations placed on it. But the thing is, is that the vast majority of news media is no longer broadcast, right? Um, you know, it's either print um, or it's cable, right? Uh, now we do have ABC, NBC, uh, CBS News and PBS as well. And all of those are broadcasters and subject to FCC guidelines. Um, but the vast majority of news media falls outside of FCC regulation. Uh, before we all go on and talk about journalistic standards serving as a, a self-check on uh, the news media, I did just want to point out that there's another sort of uh, impact that governmental regulations have on the news media potentially. And so um, there are uh, both the FCC and other federal law uh, that um, sort of prohibits one corporation from owning large swaths of the news media, uh, the number of radio stations and the number of TV stations that you own. Uh, you know, sort of that, that that this move away from sort of this monopoly power. And so that does sort of place a check on the power of 
uh, corporations that are owning up a lot of news media. But that being said, corporations can still own a lot of news media. Um, and so that while there are regulations, they're like limited in terms of, of their impact. All right, let's move on now to the journalistic standards serving as a check. And as we learned in the last lecture, uh, that journalists are professionals. They go to journalism school. They are trained by mentors. Uh, there's a culture at the news uh, organizations that they work with. And there's a legacy for a lot of places like the New York Times and the Washington Post. And, you know, even CNN to a certain degree, which has been around, you know, since the, the 1970s, right? Uh, there's a legacy that uh, that is seen as valuable and and worthy of protection. And so, you know, journalists are really guided by those, um, the standards, uh, the general standards uh, that uh, of news reporting, and also the standards of their news organization. We talked in the last lecture about this idea of principled news reporting, right? Um, and that uh, that principled news reporting is an expectation that is placed on on the journalists who work for news organizations. Uh, so editors hold journalists to these standards. Um, they expect that their journalists who they hire seek to report truth um, via fact checking, the verification of sources, investigative journalism, a lot of this we talked about in the last lecture, uh, the reporting of factual claims by legitimate sources, transparency of citing of sources, and also trying to balance the coverage of events through the objective treatment of opposing sides. Uh, and, uh, and while bias can uh, never completely be uh, left uh, outside of the, the, uh, the uh, calculation, uh, that really to keep one's own personal bias in check as a reporter as much, much as po possible. Uh, so there are standards that are set in newsrooms. And when journalists and editors fail to meet these standards, they can and they will be fired, right? Uh, and so in a way, the, the protection of a, a, a news media source uh, by its editors and by its owners, uh, that it, it really, and, and quite frankly, by its subscribers as well, uh, they don't like what they're seeing. They think it's not fact-based reporting. It could be that subscribers are going to not subscribe anymore. And, you know, historically, not super historically, but within the 20th century, there have been two real good examples of journalists who uh, failed to live up to reporting standards and they were fired. One famous one is Judith Miller. She worked for the New York Times. She did reporting on the weapons of mass destruction uh, during the 2003, the, the lead up to the Iraq war. Um, and, and it was found that the reporting that she did uh, was uh, about the Iraq's uh, 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 weapons of mass destruction program uh, that it was uh, uh, discovered to be based on inaccurate information. And she had a really close relationship with people within the Bush administration. And she was basically sort of just um, like acting like a stenographer, writing down what they told her and not doing fact checking. And she was fired. Uh, Chris Cuomo on CNN, he was fired. Uh, he was fired because he used his place as a, a member of the, the news team on CNN uh, to, uh, he used his power to uh, get some investigation that helped his brother. His brother, Andrew Cuomo, Cuomo, was the governor. He was accused of sexual harassment. And Chris Cuomo used his power as a, a, a journalist to do some investigation to get information that was going to help Andrew Cuomo um, defend himself. And he was fired. Um, so, you know, it, it does happen that um, there is a, um, a self-check on the abuse of power uh, within organizations. But again, that's only as good as the organization, right? And it's also only as good as the values that are embraced by that news organization. All right, so we've looked at the law as uh, being a potential check on the power of the news media. We've looked at journalistic standards. Well, what about the marketplace, okay? Well, before we talk about the marketplace, let's talk about the different models that are used uh, for uh, news media ownership, okay? And we see three main models of news media ownership throughout the world, okay? Uh, one is state ownership, one is public ownership, and one is uh, uh, private ownership, okay? Um, now, state ownership is like what it sounds like, okay? It's where the news media is actually controlled and owned 
by the state. And that's the kind of news media that you would have in a um, non-democratic country, an authoritarian country. Uh, and so China, Russia, North Korea, others, they have state-run media. And TASS is a really good example of that. That's one of the worldwide, that's one of the largest um, news media uh, news media organizations. Uh, and it, it's completely run uh, by the Russian state. And so any coverage that it does of the Ukraine war or of human rights abuses or what have you all come through the censorship, basically, of the Russian go government. So state on ownership. And uh, I, 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 obviously that's not uh, an ownership model that we would choose in the United States, at least not now, in order to control the power of the news media. But who knows what the future holds. Uh, then we've got public ownership, not to be confused with state ownership. So the state is when the government owns it. The public is when the public owns it, okay? Um, and so what that basically, uh, and examples of public ownership are the British Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC, uh, uh, the public broadcasting system in the United States, uh, 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 PBS, a national public radio, Wisconsin public radio. All of those are examples of public ownership. And the way that public ownership works is that uh, that uh, t uh, tax dollars are collected and then they are used for uh, broadcasting, right? And the BBC, PBS, it's both news broadcasting, uh, but it's also entertainment broadcasting, different shows and things like that. Uh, and so basically that money is put in a, a trust and then there is a, uh, a group of uh, people who run uh, like the BBC, the journalists are hired, uh, and they have no contact with the government, right? They're funded by public money, but they're not controlled by the government in, in, in any meaningful way, okay? Uh, so it's basically a way of having, assuring uh, funding for both entertainment and news media uh, without having to worry about the constant effort to generate revenue. Um, in the United States, we have a very limited uh, uh, public ownership. Uh, the vast majority of our news media is privately owned, okay? The vast majority of our entertainment media is privately owned, okay? And so when it comes to news media, pri and so private ownership is, uh, as it says there, the news media in the United States are primarily uh, owned, um, uh, are primarily privately owned businesses uh, public broadcasting only makes up uh, two percent of the market share, and when you are privately owned, it's exactly what it means. It's a corporation, right? Uh, it could be uh, owned by a, uh, you know, uh, Viacom. It could be owned by uh, Warner. It could be owned by Paramount. Uh, uh, you know, it could be owned by an ownership group. It could be owned by a family, a private family. Uh, but it's it's owned, and it's oftentimes a traded, publicly traded. On the um, on the stock market, and so uh, that news media in the United States is private ownership, private businesses, and as such, it needs revenue like any corporation. It needs profit and it needs revenue in order to survive. And if it's not making money, it will not survive. Okay, and so a lot of the eyes are on generating revenue uh, in order to stay afloat. Uh, that is the, you know, the, the news media structure, ownership structure that we use primarily in the United States. So maybe marketplace incentives are a good thing for the media, both the entertainment and the, the news media. Um, you know, you need consumers to survive and uh, you need subscribers, you need eyes for ads, um, that you need to create a product uh, that is of high quality, uh, the highest quality as possible. And, you know, in a way, the market can serve as a, a check on the quality of the news media. Uh, if the product fails to live up to the high quality journalistic standards, it'll lose readership, it'll lose viewers, it could lose ad revenue. And so in a way, if it sets its standards at a high quality, and that's what its consumers expect, then it will continue to live up to that high quality. Um, you know, and I, I have to say, uh, you know, at least when it comes to the entertainment media, uh, the marketplace incentives actually 
to a certain degree have kind of like worked in a way. Uh, you look at some of the prestige, so-called prestige TV that has been produced in the, in the in the 21st century, you know, really sort of starting with the Sopranos, continuing through with The Wire, uh, Mad Men, Breaking Bad, my favorite so show, Succe Su Succession, uh, and even Billions on Showtime, right? Uh, these are some really, and I'm sure I've left some shows out. You know, these are really outstanding shows. And I mean, in large part, they were able to happen because of HBO taking risks and HBO producing something that people were, were willing to pay for, right? Um, and so, you know, the market can sort of work in that way when it comes to entertainment. I guess the question is, is can the market work that way when it comes to the news media? I think when it comes to print journalism, like the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the New Yorker, the Atlantic, you know, I think that the I think that the market of incentive, um, you know, can kind of work. You want to keep a high quality publication, although, as we know, all those print, uh, you know, uh, 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 publications uh, struggle at times, although, uh, you know, the New York Times and other ever, ever since they put up their paywalls, so people have to pay for it. Uh, they're actually doing a lot better financially. Um, but I think that there are some problems depending on the marketplace as a check on media power um, uh, for a variety of reasons. So let's take a look at those. Uh, probably the biggest problem is that when it comes to revenue generation, principal journalism really does not sell. Uh, it may sell a little bit, it may get some market share, uh, but it really doesn't get enough. That's People aren't, you know, chomping at the bit to turn on the TV to watch, you know, the uh, PBS NewsHour, principal journalism. Uh, what they are chopping at the bit to watch and turn on is MSNBC, uh, some CNN shows, uh, and definitely Fox News, um, because that's where you are going to get your opinion driven journalism and sensationalism. Um, you know, so what does get the market share is the if it bleeds, it leads, the breaking news, you know, long a lot of coverage of, you know, uh, a mass shooting, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and, you know, opinion based um, uh, coverage. And so, you know, when you think about the marketplace, you, you know, have to maybe uh, make some assumptions about what consumers want. They actually want fact based principal journalism. Um, but some of the evidence indicates that that's really not what consumers want. Uh, oftentimes, it seems like based on consuming patterns, that uh, news consumers care less about facts. And what they care more about is a uh, reinforcement of their own ideological bias. And so you sort of turn on to MSNBC. You turn on to Fox News because you want to sit down and you want to feel good about your own ideological perspective. You want to feel good about your party. You want to feel good about your issues, right? Um, and that seems to be what sells. And, you know, this is really magnified. Uh, by mass media ownership, okay? Um, four large corporations, you know, or own four of the largest news uh, corporations in the United States. And so that there is a lot of incentive because they are owned by like AT&T, uh, that it's often about the bottom line. And the bottom line is about eyes, consumers, ad revenue, and if 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 um, uh, opinion driven journalism sells, that's what people want to uh, watch. If facts don't matter, but that's what people tune into, what doesn't really matter potentially what impact that has on our democracy, right? What matters is at the end of the day that somebody's making money. Sorry to sound so like like negative here, okay? Uh, so you know maybe the market might not be uh, the best uh, mechanism for providing the correct incentives to play checks on the power of the the news media or to support news media that's actually doing its job. And I just wanted to, you know, have this up. It's from your textbook. It just is an illustration of that, the media company consolidation. You got your AT&D, you got your Disney, you got your Comcast, you got your Fox Corporation, and then you see how they're owned out, right? That, that, that these news uh, uh, brought uh, these news entities are owned by these the very large corporations with the 
focus on revenue generation. So we started these lectures with talking about the importance, uh, the important role that the news media plays in maintaining a democratic society. You need to have a news media so that uh, that uh, citizens can be informed, they can be reasoned and reasonable, they can get, feel confident getting actively involved in participation in government, and also we need it in order to um, you know, shed light on the activities of government. And so, uh, you know, uh, that uh, uh, consumption of the news media is important in a, in a democratic society. Well, uh, you know, we're at a point in our um, a society that where we have an extraordinarily low uh, trust in the news media. I mean, and quite frankly, we have a low trust in a lot of institutions within the United States so that, that, that the news media is not unique. Uh, but, you know, this is from the uh, Gallup polling uh, that um, shows, and I love Gallup because, you know, they show uh, 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 a public opinion over time from 1973 to 2023, where we are today. Uh, and they're basically asking people, how much trust and confidence do you have in the mass media, such as newspapers, TV, and radio, when it comes to reporting the news fully accurately and fairly? If you said a great deal or a fair amount, it's going to be green, not very much, it's going to be black, and none at all. And it, it, it's going to be uh, blue, okay? Well, obviously, some trends that we see is a declining trust, uh, and a growing lack of trust and no trust in the news media. Uh, you know, but today, uh, less than a third of Americans trust uh, the news media to report the news fully and accurately and fairly, uh, 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 have a great deal or even a fair amount of trust. Uh, the remaining, what, uh, you know, uh, 60, uh, you know, 8% uh, have... Uh, not very much trust or n no trust at all. And that no trust at all is, is nearly, you know, it's nearly 40% of Americans. Uh, and so, you know, you sort of look at this and you wonder about the implications that this will have for democracy. You wonder whether or not this is fair uh, and accurate. Is it true that you can't trust the media? Do they do that crappy of a job? Or is it just a uh, a product of uh, polarization. Uh, re Republicans have uh, much lower trust in uh, in the news media than do Democrats. But even Democrats' trust in the news media has declined uh, since 2016. Okay, uh, and so uh, you know overall that you know we uh, need a, a, a good, uh, a trustworthy some a news media organizations that we trust so that we can turn to them to get the information that we need um, to actually have a vibrant democracy. Uh, but if we don't trust those news organizations, then we have no place to turn uh, to get uh, news inf information or where we turn is a place that is um, uh, most likely uh, filled with either uh, uh, myths or disinformation. Uh, so we are sort of at an interesting a place within American democracy today. So in conclusion, I, you know, I just want you to maybe think about your own relationship with the news media. Uh, how would you evaluate the job the news media is doing? Do you feel they do a good job informing, investigating, providing a meaningful public forum for debate? Or do you feel like that they don't do a good job reporting, that they're biased, um, inaccurate, not fact-based? Uh, you know, sort of what is your take on it? Or does it obviously probably uh, depend on the the, the the news source that you are consuming. Uh, do you consume the media that you think is doing a good job? So if you think that there's a news media source that is fact-based, principle-based jur journalism, uh, you know, that does is transparent uh, with its citing of, uh, uh, of its sources, et cetera, uh, is, 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 do you consume that media? Are you willing to pay for that media? Uh, and if that media fails, uh, do you stop consuming it? Do you trust the news media? And what impact does this distrust of the news media have on uh, a democratic society? All right, that's it from me. Thanks a lot for listening. I really appreciate it. And I will talk to you again soon.